very much. I'm glad to be here. This is the first time I've been to your country. I have. I, I think I'm getting a cold. You know, when you travel, you shake hands with lots of people. And then you put the hand up your nose. And that's how it happens. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand for a while, then I'll sit down, then I'll stand, then I'll sit down. And in any case, I uh, have a speech defect, a stutter, not too much. So I don't think it'll bother you too much. I want to have a discussion today. So I would like you all right now to start thinking of questions, points that you might make as I speak on the question of the morality, the ethics of what we call capitalism. Now, let me sit down and see what I mean. Um, I, I was once a socialist. In fact, my first politics was to read Prince Kropotkin Mutual Aid when I was 15 years old. And I became a socialist anarchist, so to speak. And then I became a kind of regular Marxist socialist. And then I started to study economics, and I said, well, maybe that's not going to work. So I became an interventionist social engineer. I'm from economics, and I'm going to help you, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Then I gradually became a Chicago school economist. Milton Friedman was a colleague of mine and a friend. But then I find, but then slowly I became what's a, what is normally called Austrian economics from an hour away from here in Vienna. And I, I, I started to understand that an economy is more than machinery. That's, I think, the core point of Austrian economics, and it makes a lot of sense to me. As a professor of English, as well as a professor of economics, I think that how people really are is choosing acting people. We're not machines. We're not rats. Even rats have choice. But we're more than rats. We don't simply respond to incentives, which indeed is what I was teaching in that book in, in Czech, which was published in 1985. That's when I was still very much a Chicago economist. In some ways, I still am. But you see, I've been developing, which is good. John Maynard Keynes famously said to someone who said, oh, Maynard, you've changed your views on free trade. <coughs> to which he replied, when I get new evidence, I change my mind. What do you do? It's a wise and sensible remark. So I changed my mind, and now, as, as Peter mentioned, I think of myself as following or advocating what you could call humanomics. Not to throw away the mathematics, not to say the, the machinery is all wrong, it's partly right, but to say that we need to bring in film, literature, rock music, painting, history, philosophy. We need to bring in the other capacities of humans into the account of the, the economy. And, 
And this evening, I'd, I'd like to focus on the ethics part of that. How we bring, how we think about the economy ethically. Now, the usual way that economists of all sorts, whether Marxist or bourgeois or whatever, think about the economy, is simply utilitarian. We're supposed to, each of you has a little, I notice you all have a little pleasure meter on your head. That you, 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 you can't see it, can you? But I can, I'm an economist, a trained economist. And uh, this pleasure meter moves up and down, depending on whether you're faced with apples or oranges. Uh, then we can add it all up and decide what the opinion of the room is about apples. Now, as you can see from my description, this is slightly crazy as an ethical system. But it's the core of the economist's way of thinking of the world. And it's not completely stupid. If we're going to decide to build another bridge across the Danube, right? That is the Danube out there. Isn't it? Yeah. The, the Danube seems to be everywhere. And it goes through all, like I was in Serbia just a while ago. There's the damn Danube. You can't get away from it. It's everywhere. If, we, if you're thinking of building a bridge across the Danube, it's going to cost a lot. And then it's wise to sort of ask yourself, well, how much would you pay for it? How much would you pay? And you, and you, and you, and you, which is one measure of this happiness meter in your head. And add it all up and say, well, the bridge is probably worth doing. It's a sensible way of behaving. It's how you behave in your own life. When you think you're buying an automobile or house or an ice cream cone. So, as I said, it's not crazy. And as a Harvard slash Chicago School economist, I think we ought to take this calculation seriously. And indeed, there's one part of it which I think is very important and that we ought to acknowledge right at the outset. When a proposal for a new uh, coffee shop or a new hairdressing salon, one that I desperately need. Do you know a hairdressing salon close to here? I really need it, as you can easily see. Such a proposal, so, thank you. Uh, I'll ask you afterwards. So, such a proposal to reallocate capital and labor and land, right? To say, okay, we're, we're going to open up a little factory here and make books or water or something. If it is privately profitable, usually, from the social point of view, it's a good idea. Usually, from the social point of view, it's a good idea. Now, there are exceptions. If the factory or the hairdressing salon we're proposing has tremendous, what we call, well, we could call it by normal words, spillovers. If you poison everyone in the neighborhood and they all die of cancer, <laughs> then the private profitability may be beside the point, right? But for most things, for most projects, private property is the correct test. Now, you don't have to believe me on this. I'm a um, free market type economist. You can consult the socialist theorists of the 1930s. In, in, in the great debate, the socialist calculation debate, it was realized that ideal socialism 
here at this ideal now. This is a special case. The older people here have experienced non-ideal socialism. But all right. Ideal socialism, perfectly planned by geniuses in Bratislava who get everything right, will do the same projects that a completely ideal again, free market will do. That was the conclusion of the debate. That at their sort of mutual perfection, right, socialism, capitalism, up here in the ideal world, you want efficiency, you want the largest national income to help poor people, you want an economy that functions well, at least better, and, and in both, it, it results in the same. So this, so this idea of a profit test is not peculiarly capitalistic. It's rational. You could even say reasonable in most cases. Okay? So you can see that this utilitarian, money-oriented way is not a stupid way or an unethical way, necessarily, of organizing an economy. It's not too bad. So what, what other ethical guidance have we in thinking about the economy? What other considerations are there? Well, I like to think of this, actually, I have, let, let me be a little bit complicated here. I think there are three levels of ethical concern. There's self-interest, self-cultivation, if you wish, which is not itself bad. Learning to play the cello is not a bad thing. Self-cultivation, right? It's all right. Preserving yourself and your children and so on is not a bad thing. That's self-interest. Then there's the ethics of how you treat other people, right? That's what we usually call ethics. But I'm saying to you, self-cultivation is part of ethics. It's part of our responsibilities as humans. I, I am a Christian, an Anglican, so I can, I can put it in, in Christian terms and say that as God's creature, we should take care of ourselves. We should view our bodies and our minds as God's temple and should profane them. That's, that's a very theological way of speaking, but I can make the same argument in entirely secular terms that has nothing to do with Christianity. But okay, there's the self-interest, there's how, we, how I treat you, and then there's a third part, which is how I treat the transcendent. Humans are that way. They want something more than self-interest or other people interest. They want something sacred, something holy. What's the name of the local football team here? What's it called? Slovan. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe some disagreement. Yeah. It's like Protestants and Catholics. <laughs> there you go, there's a third. Okay, so, or science. Uh, art. The family viewed in a sacred way. Not just that you should, you should, I don't know, enslave your children or starve them. That would be kind of elementary, but that you, that the family, hear this, but this transcendent level, this third level, gives an answer 
to the question, so what? So what? Every language has an expression like this. In, in Dutch, it's and new. <laughs> and now, you must have a short expression in, in Slovak that says the same thing. Yeah. Well, so what? Well, okay, there you go. I, I, I just learned that. It's useful to have it. Because it's, it's in a way the most important question. So what? If your life now doesn't have a so what, you need to work on it. <laughs> for your mental health, for your spiritual health, you need to take this question quite seriously. So, there we have the three levels. Now the economy is obviously about self-interest to some degree, so that's part of it. But the economy is not about this transcendent purpose. Transcendent purposes, <laughs> I hate to use the word, are often trumped <laughs> by, or are often trump the economy. Uh, let's take an example of Brexit. The crazy decision of a bare majority of, of, the, of the British people to vote to leave the EU. I think it's insane, it makes no economic sense, it's very stupid. But it satisfies a transcendent purpose, a transcendent goal, sovereignty. To hell with those bureaucrats in Brussels. I was just there. I saw them on the street. Terrible people. You must have been in the office. Anyway, there they were in, in, in Brussels. Uh, uh, sovereignty. If a mother is standing by a cliff with her child and some economist comes up and says, how much will you take to throw your child over the cliff? 100 foot cliff. She says, I won't take anything. And he says, well, how about $100? Give me $100 if you throw the child over the cliff. She says, go away. He says, OK, OK. I'll give you $100,000 if you throw your child over the cliff. And she says, don't be ridiculous. I don't care how much you pay me. I won't do it. The same holds for the soldier who, for king and country, goes over the top. We just had a remembrance on the 11th of November of the end of the First World War, the uh, 100th anniversary of the end of that terrible war. So there are, the transcendents are non-economic. So when we're thinking about economic ethics, we're thinking mainly then about well, self-interest, I said at the bottom, but we're also thinking about in the middle, how we should treat each other. And I think there are two ways of being good in treating other people. One was said, in the first century BCE by Hillel of Babylon, a great Jewish sage. And he put it this way. Do not do unto others as you would not want others to do unto you. And I think of that as a masculine principle, so to speak, comes, I have to say, more naturally to men than to women. I've had some experience in this. It says, leave me alone. All the women here have experienced this. <laughs> we 
was their, their, their boyfriends or their, leave me alone. I can take care of myself. Don't tread on me. Leave me alone. And it's a good and sensible principle. I saw a cartoon just the other day that showed this liberal in the Slovak sense threatening the world. This terrible liberal ho hovering on oh, this standing over the world, about to take over the world, and the caption was, a liberal about to take over the world, neoliberalism, you heard the phrase, in order to leave you alone. <laughs> take over the world to leave you alone. Doesn't sound like such a terrible thing to do. So that's the first principle. But then there's another principle, by another, Jewish sage, you may have heard of, Jesus of Nazareth. And he put the golden rule in a positive way. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is, in terms of the, of, of the parable of the Good Samaritan, don't pass by on the other side. Be nice. And I think we need both of those. And I think that if you, if you think about the ethics of a market economy or of a non-market economy this way, you'll see that having both of them in action, each of them criticizes the other and controls or, uh, what can I say, improves the other. If all you think about is the masculine, don't tread on me, leave me alone, that's okay, that's a, what we call it <coughs> liberal thought, we call it the non-aggression principle. That's, that's fine, I'm not against it, seems all right. But if it is a hard-nosed, all I need to do, ethically speaking, relative to other people, is leave them alone. <coughs> then when someone's house is burning down and they're dying and I could run in and save them, I don't. Why should I do that? Leave them alone. <laughs> Where I, and so that, so having Hillel is not enough. You need Jesus as well. And vice versa. The trouble with Jesus, his view, is that it takes over other people's lives. When we're dealing with small children, that's very appropriate. We don't let the three-year-old boy who wants to run in front of the tram do so. We don't care if he chooses to run in front of the tram. No, dear. You grab him and pull him back. Right? Although I must say, I've, I've lived in Holland for three years, and it seems to me that the mothers of Holland have a sort of Darwinian attitude towards trams and their children. They seem to I'm always shocked when I'm at a tram stop in Amsterdam or uh, Rotterdam. And these little children are running around, and the tram's coming, and the mothers just can look at them and say, mm -hmm. as you wish. <laughs> I think it's because they've been told firmly not to do it, but I, I worry about it. Anyway, um, so both figure. Now, Here's the question of the hour. What's the best way of organizing the economy to achieve a balance of these two ethical principles? The negative version of the golden rule and the positive version. And I say that the best is what you could call a Christian liberalism or a bleeding heart liberalism, which is kind of a 
American joke, or a um, um, a love. Put it this way: a loving liberalism. That's 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 not a bad phrase. I, I just thought of it: a loving liberalism. So you respect people's adult autonomy. But in a loving way. If they need help, you help them. You don't corrupt them. You don't jail them. You help them. So if they're addicted to drugs, you don't put them in jail and throw away the key. Which many of my American fellow citizens would like to do. You help them overcome their addiction, and you're willing to be taxed by the government to provide the money and facilities to do that. Say, if someone's, if the Danube out here overflows, people through no fault of their own, they didn't build in a floodplain that just overflowed unusually high, as it did not long ago, and they get flooded out, you help them. You at least go fill sandbags and try to pr protect their houses. So loving liberalism. Now what about socialism? You know, the older people in this room, as I said, know about imperfect socialism. A lot of the young people think, oh well, that was long ago. Communism was long ago. Let's, we'll do it better. We young people, we know how to do socialism. And ours was your loving socialism. Now there's a problem here. Why do people believe in socialism? It's been tried repeatedly. More or less every time it's been tried, in a thoroughgoing way, in a complete way, it's failed disastrously. I mean, not just a little bit, but really badly. Again, the older people here don't need to know this. Bratislava, in the early 1990s, was a pretty dismal place. On a Sunday morning, you couldn't get a meal. Because, though it was profitable, no one bothered to open a restaurant that would serve on Sunday morning. You know, the old, there's many socialist jokes. We pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. <laughs> Under capitalism, Man exploits man. Under socialism, it's the other way around. That's <laughs> One of the good things about socialism in Eastern Europe is that it generated a lot of very good jokes. <laughs> Let me tell you one, because it's so good. I heard it first in Poland in 1988. The week before the government agreed to speak to Solidarity. Here's how it goes. A man is sent by his wife to buy meat in communist Poland. He goes to the meat store, the butcher, and there are a hundred people there in this long line waiting to get meat at the controlled price. And he waits for an hour and gets closer, closer to the front. He's three people away <laughs> from the front. And the butcher says, I'm sorry, we're out of meat, and closes the, the uh, thing. Sorry, no meat. And the man says, starts shouting. There are lots of people still in the store. He starts shouting. He says, this communist system, this is terrible. We've got to get rid of this and adopt capitalism. This is awful. I hate it. I hate it. And 
a man comes up to him in a trench coat, you know, like a secret service agent. He says, comrade, don't talk this way. And then he, the guy goes like this, he says, so the man goes home. His wife says, did you get any meat? Of course I didn't. This stupid communist system, it's terrible. But there's worse news. They're out of bullets. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes the point. It makes the point that liberalism, markets, are about mutual agreement. And running the economy through the state whether it's full socialism or partial socialism that almost every country in the world has, a very high taxation and lots of regulation, works through the fist, works through the bullets. If you don't pay your taxes, even if you like them, if you say, oh, it's wonderful, the Slovak government is so great. It does all these wonderful things, and I'm glad to pay my taxes. If you say, if your husband decides not to pay his taxes, you go to jail. You, the gun comes out. Whereas if you don't buy a certain kind of toothpaste, remember under communism, you have one kind of toothpaste. Now you have an absurdly large number of choices of toothpaste. I don't know, 20. Okay, you decide not to buy one kind. <laughs> you, you, no one shows up at your door in a trench coat. No one takes you away. So there's a deep sense in which socialism is unethical. Deeply unethical. Look, to have an ethical system at all, there's got to be choice. Again, I'll be theological about it and talk about free will. God so loved the world that he gave us free will. That allows us to commit sins. If we were just God's pets, right, you know, a little dog, God wouldn't allow us to sin. And the three-year-old is about to run in front of the tram, you don't allow him to. And that's appropriate. For a pet, it's appropriate. But as free adults, we have choice whether to sin or not. So free will in Christianity or in Islam or in Hinduism or whatever you want is similar. Is deeply similar to the free will in a market society where you're permitted to choose. You can go to work or not. You can, uh, no, no, it may be ter terribly inconvenient not to go to work. I admit that. But at least no one shows up with a gun and forces you to go to work or forces you to buy it's that terrible automobile that used, used to have on our communism. Some horrible automobile. Yeah. And some like that. Okay. So there, there is a sense, there is a deep sense in which what we're calling right now capitalism. By the way, I don't like the word. I'll explain why in a few minutes. But why capitalism is superior to socialism, ethically speaking. Because it's about the choice of adults. Now, why is socialism so popular? Why, why do we keep getting, among young people especially, and some of the old people who have not very good memories, um, that oh, we ought to go to socialism, try it again, even though it didn't work in Russia, it didn't work in East Germany, it didn't work in Slovakia, it didn't work in China, it didn't work in Vietnam, it didn't, doesn't work in, in, uh, in Cuba, it doesn't work in Venezuela, it doesn't work. 
the evidence is extremely clear that large societies, that's an important exception, can't work under this principle of from each according to his, uh, his ability to each according to her need. And that's the formula for state socialism. It doesn't work. Why do people keep doing it? Because what I've just said is a description of the family. To each according to her need, from each according to his ability. That's how a family works and should. It's how a group of friends work, a small group of friends. I mean, <laughs> if I buy a pizza for my friends, and they come over to my house, and we've got a bunch of pizza there, and I say, well, you know, I paid for the pizza. I'm going to eat it all. That's the last time they'll come to my house. <laughs> That's a friendship-destroying uh, remark, right? But in a fam so in a family or a small group of friends, that's entirely appropriate. In a, in a military unit, that's how it works. Um, uh, soldiers work this way. And indeed, lots of small human groups work in this family way. And it's entirely appropriate and sensible and good. There's no problem with it. But elevated to a principle for a country like mine with 230 million people, or yours, what's the population? Okay, over 5 million people. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for all the usual reasons, free riding, et cetera, et cetera. But the core ethical problem is that it's compelled among a group of friends, now here we're getting again to this matter of the transcendent, or in a family, the transcendent value of friendship, this top level of ethics, is what governs and should. And it works just fine. But in the middle, how you treat other people, how you treat strangers in particular, People with whom you have no sacred obligations, no, uh, um, well, no is perhaps too strong a word, but who, that, that, you, that the ordinary way of dealing with people in a large society is as anonymous contractors. You hand the person money for the newspaper and he gives you the newspaper. And you don't have to be his friend. So you see, capitalism is an ethical system. Before telling you, I promise you, I'm going to tell you why I don't like the word capitalism. Okay, suppose I, I tell you now. It's a stupid word. It's completely wrong. It's a scientific error <laughs> squeezed into a word. What's wrong with it? is that capital accumulation is not how an economy becomes rich. Adam Smith, <laughs> whom I extravagantly admire, was the one who started this mistake. He was comparing, I don't know, the highlands of Scotland with the most prosperous area of Europe at the time, namely Holland. And he, he talks frequently about how Holland has accumulated capital. You know, it's built the canals and houses and so on, and that's what makes it rich by comparison with this impoverished area of his own country, Scotland. So he started this, Marx followed it. All economists, whether Marxist or bourgeois, have followed this idea that what makes us rich is piling up capital. And that is completely wrong. 
What makes us rich is good ideas. Good ideas for using capital, using labor, using land, using the rights we have as citizens of a free country. Those are the things that make us rich. We, look, think of this hotel. Very nice hotel, highly recommend it. You take this hotel and put it 30 kilometers out of town in the middle of a, I don't know, bean field or something. And it suddenly becomes worthless because it's a terribly bad idea to have a hotel 30 kilometers out of Bratislava in the middle of a bean field. Not by the airport, somewhere else. It's a stupid idea. So you see, pouring capital into an economy is not the idea. Is not how to get rich. Having good ideas is what you need to do. Now, how do you have good ideas? How, well, let's let's first let me make. A couple of points on the economic history here, and then we'll get back to the core ethical question, and then we'll start having a discussion. You have to understand, if, if you learn nothing else from this evening, understand the following quantitative point. Since 1800, real income per head in Slovakia has increased easily 20 times real income per person. The ability to purchase goods and services. And all you have to do is kind of look around this room to know that that's true. I take it there are no descendants here of the crowned heads of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Habsburgs in the audience? I won't mind, but I doubt there are. <laughs> I know that my people were Irish and Norwegian peasants. <coughs> Everyone here, I'm afraid, I look around and all look kind of low class to me. <laughs> I know that I look low class. We're not the descendants of aristocrats. And the <laughs> people in 1800 that were your great, 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 great grandparents were unspeakably poor. I mean, really poor. They died young. They were undernourished. They were shorter than you are because they were undernourished. They were ignorant. Um, I speak of my Irish ancestors. My Norwegians can read, but not the Irish. Uh, they uh, had no education at all, beyond nothing. <laughs> their ability to travel was their feet. That, there is a famous episode when the when the Soviets back in 1940 wanted to show that American capitalism was a terrible mess. And there was a movie that had just come out called The Grapes of Wrath, which was a movie of um, a dramatization of a great book by John Steinbeck called The Grapes of Wrath, about a poor family from Oklahoma that moved to California to avoid starvation and bankruptcy. Uh, and to work uh, picking fruit, right? These were farmers going to pick fruit. And the Soviets said, ah, yes, this will show how terrible the American system is. So they had, they released the film in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and it backfired because the Joad family, that was their name, fled from Oklahoma to California by automobile. <laughs> Russians recently starved to death a bunch of people in 
Ukraine. They escaped starvation by walking. So this didn't work very well. They withdrew it immediately. So they understand a factor of 20. Not a Dublin, Tripling. Ask yourself, how much better off do you think you are than this person in 1800 or 1900 or even 1989? And if you say 100%, you're way underneath compared to 1800. It's 2,000%. It's a gigantic improvement. How did it come? It came, I said, from ideas. Where did the ideas come from? They came from liberalism. They came from letting people try things out. They came from freeing people from serfdom and, uh, and, and, and sexism. It came from a free society. Free societies are productive. Free societies are imaginative. Free societies are creative. In a way, this is perfectly obvious. Unless you believe that the fist is how you get progress, Unless you believe that forcing people to do stuff is how things get, get better, then you'll find this very easy to believe and you'll buy my books and make me rich. <laughs> so let's go back to our ethical question here. Oh, by the way, I should say, uh, you, you understand why I don't think that capitalism is a good word. Because it suggests to people that piling up capital is what the core of the economy is. And I have friends all over the world who believe this. Yanis Varoufakis, you know who he is? The finance minister of Greece for a while. Until he was fired. Yanis is a personal friend of mine. Here's how cool I am. I've been on Giannis' motorcycle. I mean, how cool can you be? But Giannis, though he's a very intelligent guy, understands the economy to be about flows of capital. And that's not what an economy is. An economy is about agreements to trade and ideas for new trade. That's where it is. And this sloshing back and forth about capital, because capital is what the Giannis thinks the economy is. It's wrong. Poor Giannis, he's got it wrong, but he's got a very nice motorcycle. <laughs> Which is the only way to get through traffic in Athens. OK. So capital is, let's call it instead, innovism. Innovism. People say neoliberalism has a bad side. Neoliberalism causes people to be unemployed. It causes people to be hurt. We need to protect people from the hurtful side of neoliberalism. That is wrong. What people are complaining about is not neoliberalism, that is allowing the market to make these choices instead of the state, instead of the government. What they're complaining about is change. Change is disturbing. People would rather be secure than free. In fact, I'm told that in Slovakia, the holy word is security, not liberty, equality, but security. OK, that's a problem. If you want security, a 
It's okay, you can have it, but then you're going to be poor. You're going to stay poor. You're not poor now, but you're going to, you're going to be poor. And you're, you're going to stay whatever you are. Look, how do we get security economically? Never change anything. Easy. <laughs> if there's a hairdressing salon in the neighborhood, it stays. No new ones are open. If there's a farmer who's making beans or cabbage, he goes on making exactly the same, growing exactly the same beans and cabbage for the rest of his life. You do tomorrow exactly what you did today. <laughs> Never change. Security. The problem is that you're your children and your grandchildren will be just as poor as you are. They'll have fewer and they'll have no opportunities of the sort that since communism you've gained, and indeed since 1800 you've gained. So change is what's worrying people. Now, as an old person, I understand change. I'm very irritated by much of the change in my life. On the other hand, as an economist, a uh, person who believes in innovism, I say to myself, oh, Gerger, stop being so irritated by the novelties. So, in short, that's the claim. Not only is innovism a virtuous system, it's the only virtuous system. If you want to be treated like a child or a slave or a pet, then embrace state violence. There are many other problems with state violence, among which is that you get cheated. That the people with the guns win. The old joke version of the um, golden rule is, those who have the gold rule, instead of being the golden rule, it's those who have the gold rule, those who have the guns rule. They haven't run out of bullets. So in short, I highly recommend loving liberalism as the way forward for Slovakia and for us all. Thank you very much.